Um, I'm not very sure if, uh, if everybody here is here for the same purpose, uh, the cash for honours uh, time and the selling of peerages that was uh, felt to have happened at one time at Westminster, and it's, uh, if it was felt to have happened one time, circumstances haven't changed at all. Uh, by way of introduction, I should say I'm Angus McNeil. I'm an SNP MP. Uh, I'm the guy who, in March 2006, uh, happened to think that uh, there might be an act of parliament in amongst the, the hot air uh, that was going on. And I think um, if I look back at the genesis, that has been nine, nine and a half years ago now, maybe. Um, if I think back to that time, uh, I was a young MP. I was in the House of Commons for about 10 months. Uh, and there was an awful lot of indignation uh, that the... Uh, that there was a correlation between uh, people who were giving money uh, to that time uh, Mr Tony Blair's Labour Party were finding themselves ennobled from Mr Tony Blair's Labour government. Um, and this, the, the, the feeling was there was mentioned one time or one day at um, the parliamentary uh, business questions about a time in history when Lloyd George was doing this and one Labour MP pointed out that uh, there was an act or words of that effect, and I, I went back later to find out what the Act was and asked a researcher to Google the Act. Uh, we found the 1925, and I'm grateful to Andrew here uh, for reminding me of that, and the year of the Act it was the 1925 uh, Honours the Prevention of Ab Abuses Act, I think, if I've got the right title. Right. Um, and we looked at that Act, and we asked the sort of the straightforward, daft, laddie questions. What does the Act say? What does it do? And what does it mean? Uh, the Act said don't sell honours. The Act said don't buy honours. And if you did sell or buy honours, you could, I think, face about two years in jail. The genesis of the Act in the 20s, of course, was Lloyd George had turned it into a cottage industry. Uh, he'd invented a whole pile of honours with just about a, 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 a cash tag to each one. Uh, OBEs and MBEs were basically created for the purpose of raising money for Lloyd George. Uh, at the moment, they, they might be seen by some as an honour, uh, but their, their origins, I think it's fair to say, they were quite tacky. Uh, in fact, the, there was one fellow, uh, Mondi Gregory, uh, who, who had a whole, uh, just was, I think, the, the broker for Lloyd George. I'm looking at Andrew quite a lot because it's nine years. I was quite well versed in this nine years ago, but uh, I'm not as well versed as I was. There was also um, uh, an independent Labour MP from Liverpool whose name escapes me. It's it's case, 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 right. uh, and uh, he'd complained about this. Uh, he went into a house in London uh, belonging to Mondy Gregory and was never seen again. Uh, and Alex Salmon's joke to me at the time was he'll be bobbing, bobbing down the Thames one morning, Angus, uh, because such were the forces that certainly in the 20s were taken on. But what we unleashed uh, were certainly a whole chain of events that led to the question of the Prime Minister uh, by the police. And I think, to go back to first principles on this, quite often daft laddie questions, as I put it, are not often asked. Uh, if we take something in the current situation, the current Prime Minister is quite keen to get involved in bombing ISIS in Syria. The uh, point I'm trying to get to the bottom of on that is if he's, if he's bombing ISIS in Iraq at the moment, which he is, is he going to bomb them in Syria less? How many aircraft is he using in Iraq at the moment? How many aircraft is he using in Syria? If he's going to bomb them less in Iraq, uh, or if he's going to bomb them by the same amount in Iraq, is he bombing them not to full intensity at the moment? Uh, and there are a whole pile of questions just to set the scene that very often at the beginning of a political process, and I just use that current one um, as a what for, uh, there are often examples, there are often cases at the beginning of a political process, simple questions that we don't ask ourselves because we think we should know the answers or we think we have a feeling of what's going on. We don't have any idea really, this has not been set out yet in the House of Commons, what would the percentage extra effort the UK would bring to involving itself in bombing Syria. And as somebody else one of my uh, former colleagues pointed out in uh, one of our, our former chief of staff, there's not exactly a surplus of targets left in Syria at the moment. Uh, so to try and ask some basic questions to ascertain some sort of groundwork, which was what we did uh, in amongst uh, the, the, the cash for honours. It started in March 2006, uh, after I found the, probably the not well published, and maybe this is the first time I've said this publicly, what actually happened was, having found the uh, law, there was a law against it, I phoned a man from uh, the Press Association, uh, um, Moncrief, Chris, Chris Moncrief, who was the journalist. He was a, quite an elderly man at the time. And he asked me, um, what was I going to do about it? He, said, he asked me, was I going to tell the police? And I said, yes. And that was the, basic, the beginning 
of, well, I said it was against the law, so he asked me, going to tell the police? I said, yes. And that was the beginning. By the time I got off the phone, I told my search, we'd agreed to, we're going to tell the police. We decided not to share it or discuss it with too many others because there's often reasons for people telling you not to do something. And anyway, once it was in the public area, once it was in the press hands, it was in the public domain, you can't exactly go back in your word as a politician. Uh, and I, although politicians have a bad name for going back in their words of the promises, if you do, uh, in very obvious ways, your, your name is mud. So, so we, we, we went for it. Uh, and we felt there was a sort of a justice in what we were saying. Uh, the statistical chances of, the, of getting, of giving a... Um, of giving a million pounds and getting a period should be something along one in, I don't know, is it two billion or something? We, weird like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll deal with this. Yeah, you'll deal with the stats. <laughs> the stats are massive, is, is, is the uh, against are massive. Uh, but the correlation was very close. I think everybody that gave a million pounds to the Blair government or the Blair ruling party at that time found themselves either ennobled or uh, a knighthood or, or a peerage. Uh, and it was. Uh, it was on the basis of that. It was also, I've got to say, a, a feeling on my side that uh, Tony Blair had got off with the Iraq war. And I still got off with the Iraq war. And it's a personal point of view of mine, not related really to cash for honours. Al Capone got off with gangsterism, but was found in tax evasion. I thought this might be the equivalent of the, of the tax evasion uh, for, for, for Tony Blair. And unfortunately, it wasn't. Uh, a number of things happened, of course. Uh, up to about 48 people were interviewed. I only realised that uh, today as I was preparing for this. Uh, it was actually quite a busy time, and uh, listening to some of uh, Blair's uh, former colleagues, they said this occupied an awful lot of their time um, trying to ex make their explanations for this. Uh, the correlation, as I said, was far too close. Uh, it was clearly creating a lot of discomfort for them. Uh, there was a notable period uh, in um, 2006 when the political appointee, Lord Goldsmith, uh, called for him to, be, uh, to distance himself uh, from any decision as to whether criminal charges would be brought. And I think when you get to the bottom of here is there's a feeling of in the UK that if we're doing it, we're, we're good people, we're honest people, we're straightforward people. We can't possibly be corrupt. That's the sort of thing that happens in faraway countries where the sun shines a bit more warmly. Uh, in fact, when you got very close to, to the behaviour, as I saw it at, at the House of Lords, people find their way into the House of Lords, people often excuse a number of things that they do with very plausible reasons that work in their heads and but just don't work to any further scrutiny at all. And I think that was, uh, that was becoming absolutely clear during this. It became quite clear after a lot of this that... Um, that um, it became clear after that a number of them didn't want to talk about it, which uh, I think I remember when the, when the end of the process came and the, the, the decision made not to prosecute, uh, I, f I felt that... Now, some of the witnesses, or one of them, had spoken on Newsnight. I thought if he'd got into a court with the difficulty he had with a Newsnight interview, he would have crumbled in court. The police had the problem of marrying up a nod and a wink uh, with, uh, with the situation of the selling of honours. Um, there was nothing written. There was understandings all over the place. Um, there, was a, there was previous patterns of behaviour where you could see that where others had given large sums, they got X. If I was to give a large sum, would I get X as well? And um, it was very, very difficult for them to find that. So I thought that would have happened within the courtroom. Since then, of course, there have been a subsequent, which Andrew will probably t touch on, there have been subsequent revelations, I would say, by Lord Oakshot, who said that the Liberals were up to this themselves in the last two or three years. The police, unfortunately, don't have an appetite for, for this anymore. Uh, I wrote to Cressida Dick, uh, the then acting commissioner, who... Um, who basically took a long time to, to, to respond, but, but the moment wasn't there at all, and the police, for whatever reasons, perhaps having f felt themselves burned by the lack of progress in the 2006-2007 investigation, found themselves not, or found out, we all found them not very open uh, to going any further with this. In fairness to the police, I think that in 2006 they weren't very interested in going very far either. Uh, they did some scoping stuff on the sort of general public evidence we brought them. But it was at the point where they felt, and having spoken to the police afterwards, uh, they, they felt that people they should have looked up to in the country weren't being as straight with them as they felt they should. Uh, they felt that um, people, who thought, people thought of them as just plod, was their word, and uh, they thought that they would leave that investigation with a higher opinion of the highest people in the land than they had at the beginning of it. Well, I can tell you, and I haven't said this publicly before, uh, they, 
told me that they left, or some of the officers told me that they left that um, after the investigation was finished, that they left that investigation with a feeling, a feeling that was the very opposite of that. They didn't leave with the highest feeling or the, uh, with the highest regard for the highest heads in the land, which I think is quite, quite in, in, instructive, uh, really, in, um, in, 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 the, in the whole uh, process. And if I was a betting man and to put my mortgage on it, or if I was to say someday will we find out for definite that this was happening, or will people admit to it? I think there are, I think it is happening. I think it's still happening. Um, but will I, people admit to it? No, they probably won't, because everybody who's in it uh, are probably in a mutually assured destruction package. Uh, if they were to uh, were to admit it, I think the consequences would be huge, and maybe that's why it will it will go no further. Uh, and it went on as far as the 7th, 9th, 20th of July, um, and I think it's the 9th of October, the current prosecution said there was insufficient evidence. There, was a, there wasn't the balance of probability of, a char of being, charges being successful in a court of law. They didn't say it was impossible. I think it was a 30%, 40% threshold. Maybe Andrew remembers the figure by, better than, than, than I do. Um, but in essence, that was the long and the short. From my memory and recollection of, of cash for honours, I'm quite happy to take to take a few questions if anybody chooses and would like to ask them, uh, and I'll try and answer them as openly and clearly and as I can with the nine years having gone past and other priorities I have to say in my political life since then. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there were a number of contradictions in, in the sort of positions that they held. And these contradictions work well, or work well, certainly for the great communicator that he was, or the great communicator that he seemed to be long we used to his communications, Tony Blair, uh, at that period, uh, ten, 10 years ago. You could interchange words. I mean, his basis for going to war for, for Iraq wasn't regime change, and then suddenly we'll, we'll maybe know fully with the Chilcot inquiry. These, in, in some ways, are still uh, live, live issues. I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, matter there, honours honor for party services as opposed to honours for public services. There's, I think, a period in Tony Blair's mind that party and public probably meant the very same thing uh, as he had his sofa, sofa government. But I think the upshot of all that is, had this gone to a court of law to be tested and, and tested with... But not by journalists, not by politicians, out of whose minds I think, in, in fairness to, to my discipline and fairness to the discipline of journalism as well, aren't as, as professionally trained and aren't as focused on, as you pointed out there, a word and the significance of a word. And then, do the, then the, the, the return of a witness then feeling uncomfortable and things changing, and that dissonance that could go on in, in a witness box, I think there was an awful lot that, that could have come out. And there's an awful lot that, when police were, were talking uh, to, um, to the likes of Tony Blair, he was well versed in interviewing. He'd, lo he'd done loads of them. Um, so he wasn't an average member of the public being interviewed. He was, of, in fairness, also being, of course, interviewed in a sort of slightly different set of circumstances under caution. Um, but it would have been far different had that gone to court of law. And I think I think that whatever the balance of probability was before, and I think the balance of these probabilities also changes during the process of court as well. So it would have been a service to have seen that go further. Yes, sir, the back. Very good question. You remind me of something. <laughs> There was uh, actually I was on what they would what's called a fact-finding mission by by, by by those of MOC, but we were visiting Stockholm at the time and seeing how schools were working, how a number of things were happening. And when you're on when you're on one of these trips, there are MPs of various parties, and you're rubbing shoulders and talking to people you don't normally deal with. And one Labour MP asked me, "What did what did the SNP do? Do we send people to the Lords?" I said, "No." And she goes, "Goodness, how do you fund yourself?" 
<laughs> and I think, I think, <laughs> what should be? Um, <laughs> she's still there. I haven't, I haven't blown the gaffer, but I had, I had uh, mentioned her several times in, in media, and I got hard stares from her from the last eight years. So she's only mellowed in the last six months. So <laughs> I'd be reluctant, I'd be reluctant to go back to that situation. <laughs> um, but the uh, the situation, uh, you know, when, when when she said that, I thought we betrayed so much. And your, your question is just reminding me of that, of keeping the funding factory open. Uh, I think we can also, I think there are consequences uh, to that in the years before that and the years after that. In the years before that, as SNP were a small party, the Scottish National Party, we just couldn't cope with the big funding machine that was coming into, to us from the south. What happened then uh, with this from 2006 onwards, we reckoned it probably hit Labour for about £2 million coming up to the Scottish election in 2007, which, given we won that by one seat, might have had a democratic effect as well. Now, it almost says the way I presented it there, like we, it was advantageous to us to have a level playing field. Yeah, it was. But, of course, what I'm saying is previously there was, in, there was built in advantage uh, to others who were playing the game of the, of the funding factory, which was the House of Lords, of sending people to the House of Lords. I think it's back again. I think Cameron will, is getting emboldened again uh, with the straightforward, he's given me money, he finds himself in the Lords, and the whatever explanation... That, that, that there is for it. So it is important for them to keep going because I think, I think on the other hand, uh, will the public accept uh, funding of political parties? Probably not. Uh, will the, uh, will we, would we want a situation to have in America with sort of op open money? I think we all agree we don't want that so across the political parties. I think we agree, we agree that. Uh, so we, what we have here is probably, a, a, in, the, in the words that might be used, we have a, a very British... Uh, corrupt solution going on to a very particular British problem, if that's fair to say. Anybody else? Do you think it might help to solve the issues of corruption? There is a need to solve Yeah, yeah, you know, indeed. I think absolutely. I mean, I think if, if what, what's wrong with, with the system is is the feeling that we, we're all being taken from, for, for mugs. You know, if, if, you, if we just bid for them and, and the daftest, richest man we can find is going to pay 10, 20, 30 million for them, you know, I just say the democracy is for sale and, and we're open and honest about that. Then I think it leads on to other, other questions. But, you know, I think it's, it's taking us for fools and the, and the nod and the wink is the problem uh, initially. I don't think I'd like to uh, see that situation in, in a democracy, but, you know, is that any worse than the mates of the Prime Minister or the mates of the leader of the opposition or the mates of uh, Nick Clegg, all 12 of them who've just jumped in? There's actually, he's a, Liberals have appointed more uh, to the Lords and their farewell honours than they got elected into the Commons. Um, so we have, we have now, I was with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy one time uh, in Montenegro doing some capacity work with a small party there, and the leader of the, of the programme or, the, or, the, or the, one of the directors of the foundation came along and said, when we take people from wherever across the world that we've been preaching democracy to, and we take them to the, house, to the Houses of Parliament and we show them the House of Commons, the elected chamber down there to our right, and we look up the corridor and on the left we have the House of Lords, what do we tell them about the way we run our system, that we have more parliamentarians that are unelected than elected? The answer was, we don't mention that. So it's a great big gaping dirty secret that we all know about, but we don't talk about. Uh, and in some ways, I think, you know, the reform might come if we're just being honest about what's happening. Uh, and I think, I think I'm giving a cynical answer in this, <laughs> in a sweeter way as I possibly can. Any other final question for a hand over to Andrew? Andrew, that's your cue, sir. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the statistical work that we did on this, but, uh, uh, the, uh, the inspiration for doing some statistical work came from uh, the observation that if you name somebody and say export their peerage, uh, you're liable to find yourself in court on an expensive uh, libel uh, issue. 
Uh, so, just to give some background, there have been persistent rumours uh, about the Cash for Honours scandal, which erupted in 2006 uh, with Angus question uh, and complaints for Metropolitan Police. Uh, the Prime Minister and several aides were questioned under caution, but in the end, no charges were brought. There has, in fact, only ever been one successful prosecution under the 1925 Act. Um, uh, some background on the Lords themselves. It's uh, almost 100% appointed legislative changer, chamber. Some members actually sit ex officio, so there are the bishops. Uh, there are still 92 hereditary peers who ironically have a better democratic mandate than any of the others, being as they are elected uh, by all of the hereditaries uh, who were kicked out in the reforms in the late 90s. Uh, appointments of life. Uh, the Parliament Acts of 1911 and 1949 do limit the power of the Lords to simply revising and delaying legislation. Uh, so although it's the undemocratic chamber, it is subordinated uh, to the elected House of Commons. But peers are still influential. They can ask parliamentary questions, they can take part in committee work, uh, and they can influence legislation. And here is the House of Lords at work. Um, uh, <laughs> I think there are four of them asleep in that shot. Uh, there are shots with more of them asleep than that. Uh, that was just the, they were just low resolution, those ones. Uh, in terms of the appointment process, nominally all of the appointments are royal appointments, but in reality they are effectively appointed by the leaders of uh, the UK's political parties. Um, those appointments are technically vetted by the House of Lords Appointments Commission, uh, but to the extent that they act as a watchdog, they make Ipso look like a saber-toothed tiger. Um, uh, the leaders of political parties could nominate for a number of reasons. Sometimes it could be a genuine desire to improve the quality of debate, but it's also possible that they could be nominating for reasons of political patronage. Uh, and indeed, fundraising may be another motive. Um, uh, now, a bit of history. Originally, the appointments were all entirely in the gift of the monarch uh, and frequently used to just buy off potential opposition or shore up support in an area where they were lacking it. Uh, later, it was actually began to be used by monarchs for raising revenues, uh, and the Stuart dynasty uh, was a particularly egregious uh, uh, practitioner of that. Uh, Merit-based honours are actually a very recent idea. It really comes down to Victorian prudish uh, and it became uh, an idea uh, in the 19th century, really. Uh, Lloyd George was notorious for the sale of honours, right down to having a catalogue with the prices that were listed. Uh, and he did, as you said, invent new honours in order to sell them. He, the, one of the profitable ones was, I think, the Order of the Thistle. Uh, but you were only allowed 12 of those. And this is why he created the OBE and the MBE uh, to, to, to sell them and made them in the honours hierarchy equal to the Order of the Thistle. Um, uh, Honours were sold on a huge scale, but the sale of peerages was actually relatively rare. And the problem that people had, the reason this was a scandal, was not so much um, uh, the sale of honours per se, it was just the flagrant nature of it. So that led to the uh, Honours Prevention of Abuses Act of 1925, uh, and this really was rather a case of something must be done, this is something, therefore we must do this, because the, honors, this, the Act is actually relatively toothless. Uh, which is why, uh, it, it, why there's been such problems getting prosecutions, successful prosecutions, uh, since the 2006 complaint. Basically, the only way you are going to be convicted under the 1925 Act is if you're walking down the high street with a T-shirt that says, get your peerages here. Um, uh, you, you have to do it that flagrantly. Uh, the only conviction that there has been was Maundy Gregory in 1933. He was, as you said, Lloyd George's agent. Uh, the mere fact that Lloyd George was now out of power and had no influence whatsoever, Maundy Gregory did not see this as any reason to stop selling peerages. Uh, and this was, uh, what un what was what undid him. It was a great gig uh, because uh, if you sold somebody a peerage and you didn't deliver it, what are they going to do? Complain to the police that they had tried to buy a peerage, they would end up being convicted as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the problem where he came unstuck, though, was where he sold one. He sold a baronetcy to somebody who then died and was sued by the deceased person's estate. Uh, and the, dece the, the customer being deceased, uh, the estate was not in danger of being imprisoned uh, as a result. 
Uh, so patronage, real politic, and sale are actually hardly a departure from the norm that could really, with the House of Lords, be viewed as business as usual. Um, uh, the sale of peerages uh, feeds into wider concerns about money and politics. Elections are an expensive business, and the money has to come from somewhere. It's actually already been demonstrated through a randomized controlled trial that uh, donations do, in fact, buy you access to lawmakers. Uh, there was a, a, an excellent study of this, uh, which was published quite recently by Keller and Brockman, uh, where, which was done in the United States. They wrote to uh, congressional staff asking for a meeting, uh, and uh, in the treated cases, they mentioned that they had made donations, and in the untreated cases, they didn't mention that they had made donations, and uh, the treated cases were far more likely to get a meeting with a congressional staffer than the untreated cases. Um, so access... Le so money buys access, but the question then becomes, does access lead to direct influence? Uh, that's the missing link. And if money can buy peerages, then in the British case, that link is made. Uh, because if you have a peerage, you have influence. Uh, so the data that we looked at, the key data sources are donations uh, from the UK Electoral Commission website, uh, which they only started publishing in 2001, uh, believe it or not, uh, and the names of uh, nominees, which are mostly public information. Uh, note we're saying nominees, uh, people whose appointment is blocked by the House of Lords Appointment Commission. It doesn't usually come out uh, at the time. There's no press release issued. It does frequently leak uh, a few uh, weeks or months later, however. Uh, but sometimes peers donate through a company they control, or the donations come from a direct family member or a company that they control. Uh, so we need the positions of peers and the, and the positions that their direct family members hold as well in order to tie those donations back to individuals. The Register of Lords Interests was useful for that. Uh, UK Company Check website and who's who and who was who uh, have all been useful tools in backing that out. Uh, gathering the data over this period actually took us about six months um, to trace through all these sources. Uh, from these sources, uh, we created an original data set which covers all donations uh, 2001 to 2014 uh, by Lord's nominees over 2005 to 2014. So notice that every one of the three major UK-wide parties um, uh, was actually in government at that time. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we, we've got a good, we've got good coverage of all of the major political parties that could be implicated here. Um, uh, patronage uh, could be a substantial reason for appointment. Um, and what's more, in the UK's unwritten constitution, some of these posts, or there are some positions, such as Chief of Staff, uh, or Commissioner of Metropolitan Police, or Archbishop of Canterbury, or Cabinet Secretary, where basically a peerage is almost part of the pension package. Uh, so uh, we need to allow for this by distinguishing between two kinds of nominees for a peerage. Uh, one group we label the usual suspects, uh, and the other we refer to as the others. Uh, the usual suspects comprise uh, a, very, uh, a, a very binary list. Uh, either you're in this group or you're not. Ex-parliamentarians, which includes MEPs, MSPs, assembly members in Wales, uh, senior party staff, so somebody who had a senior role within the party, within it, one of the three uh, political parties that we're looking at, uh, an ex-council leader or a council leader. Uh, they do sometimes uh, nominate people within their party from local government. Uh, a goat, uh, not the animal. This, is, these, this group is exclusive to the Labour Party. It stands for Government of All the Talents. Uh, during Brown's uh, time as Prime Minister, uh, there was a, uh, a, a thing going on where he would appoint uh, somebody who was uh, supposed to be extremely talented. They would sit in order, to, and he would appoint them to the Lords in order so that they could take on a cabinet position or a position in the government. Um, there's also JIPP. This stands for Joint Interim Peers Panel. Uh, and this, this is uh, unique to the Liberal Democrats. Um, uh, the Liberal Democrats went through a phase where the membership said, um, actually, we want to be electing our nominees uh, for the peerage. 
Uh, and so nominally, uh, Lib Dem nominees are supposed to be drawn from this list. There is a loophole, however, which has basically allowed all leaders from Charles Kennedy, uh, from Mingus Campbell to Nick Clegg to actually appoint whoever they want without much reference to this list. Nevertheless, people who have been appointed from this list, uh, we can see a reason why they have been, on, why the, why have they have been appointed. Uh, and then reserve public sector posts. So these are the people like the former cabinet secretaries, the former archbishops of Canterbury, and so on. Um, uh, and finally, there's also HOLAC nominees. Now, this is a group of people who have actually been nominated by the House of Lords Appointments Commission, and they normally sit as crossbenchers. Uh, so these categories are all associated with some form of patronage or some form of public service. It doesn't mean there's nothing improper uh, going on uh, with a lot of these categories. For example, it is entirely possible, and one of the stories that frequently comes out uh, regarding ex-parliamentarians is if you've got a backbencher who's not going to be any use in any kind of government role, sitting in a safe seat, uh, and you want to get somebody else who might be more useful into that seat, uh, then you just kick, kick the backbencher up to the House of Lords uh, and get... Huh? An inducement. Uh, no, there, there would actually be nothing illegal about that. Uh, you're perfectly, uh, it's perfectly fine to sell your seat for an inducement of this sort. Uh, it's, uh, the only problem is if we start selling the seats for cash. Um, uh, so uh, cash uh, is just not likely to be part. These appointments just aren't likely to be part of any kind of cash transaction. And they do actually make up the majority of nominees. Uh, the others are the nominees with no record of public service that is captured by that list. Notice they could have some form of public service, just not one that's captured by that list. Uh, this is one of the things about data work. We need to come up with a consistent uh, way of categorizing these nominees. Um, uh, there's nothing inherently wrong here in terms of appointing somebody uh, uh, from outside one of these groups, some, somebody who's not one of the usual suspects. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing necessarily corrupt about that. It's entirely plausible that the people with relevant expertise to the House of Lords don't come from one of those backgrounds. For example, business people may have relevant experience. Uh, charity, people who run charities may have relative experience. And... Um, uh, academics, for example, uh, may have uh, relevant experience. Uh, the House of Lords Appointments Commission, I suspect, know where to find me. Um, uh, but if there is a trade in peerages, we would expect the buyers to be in this group. Um, so, uh, some summary statistics. Of the 303 nominees over the period, seven are excluded because they are from minor regional parties normally, uh, and every single person who that party nominated was a usual suspect. So we're not going to get any variation in some of our key variables there. Uh, the remainder uh, have party affiliations shown below and split out by the usual suspects. Uh, the only thing that's uh, slightly surprising uh, in this data is the, the Conservatives are appointing roughly 50-50. Uh, usual suspects and others. Uh, for the others, it's about 70 to 80 percent are usual suspects uh, versus uh, 30 to 20 percent from the others. And the cross benches are largely dominated uh, by people from a public service background that we've captured there. Uh, so if peerages are expected, this is the first test we're going to be looking for in the data. If peerages are indeed being purchased and part of financial transactions, then we would expect that the average donation from somebody from the others must be larger than the average donation from the usual suspects. Uh, so we're going to test whether that donation, whether that is, whether the donations are the same. If we fail to reject that test, then there is no case to answer. Uh, so this is our first hypothesis test we're going to run. There is no difference in average donation of usual suspects and others. And if we can't reject that hypothesis, there probably isn't any case to answer here. Uh, if big donors do buy peerages, then big donors uh, should be more likely to receive a peerage than a member of the general public. Uh, so probability of being nominated given you're a big donor should uh, be eat the same as the probability of being nominated if you're a member of the public. Uh, it, that's, what, that's what we're going to test. If we fail to reject that, that, that hypothesis in a statistical test, then there is no case to answer. So there's our second test. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, we want to check whether the House of Commons, uh, the, the, the possibility of being elected, the need to be elected to the House of Commons, does that act as a good uh, uh, protection for the House of Commons? So if it doesn't, uh, then we would expect... Uh, to see uh, the, roughly the same number of big donors in the Commons as we do in the Lords. So there is our third test. <laughs> Sorry, uh, members of the Commons are, are as likely to be the big donors as nominees to the Lords. If we fail to reject that, uh, then uh, there is again no case to answer. Uh, so first of all, looking at this first test, uh, these are the average donations by political party and by group. So for the Conservatives, for Labour and the Liberal Democrats, uh, we are looking at uh, between 20 and 100 times uh, more being donated by people from the others than is donated by the usual suspects. Uh, so the others are donating on average far more than the usual suspects. Uh, that looks fairly damning, but we want to see if it's a trick of randomness. Uh, we need to run some statistical tests to check that. Uh, these are the difference in means tests. These are the p-values uh, on difference in means tests. So this is the probability that those differences are, that these things are being drawn from a distribution with the same mean, uh, and those things are, uh, and, and we're just getting uh, these different averages as a result of pure coincidence. Uh, almost, so for all nominees, uh, it's significant at the 1% level, uh, uh, for the Conservatives, the Lib Dems and Labour, uh, it's significant certainly at the 5% level, sometimes at the 1% level. The only group where it's not significant is the crossbenchers, the ones not being appointed by any political party. Uh, and we also excluded people who gave uh, more than £2 million and excluding people who gave more than £1 million to check that this isn't being driven uh, by outliers. Uh, and it doesn't look as if it is on the whole, certainly not for the Conservatives. Uh, for Labour, uh, we need to define outliers as people who've given more than a £1 million, and that's actually excluding quite a few. Uh, and similarly for the Lib Dems, that's not excluding so many, uh, but uh, the problem is that we do start getting into very small sample sizes for the Lib Dems uh, when we are looking at that, because we are being limited uh, by... Uh, if I go all the way back over here, we're being limited by, in terms of sample size, we're being limited by the smaller of these numbers here, the others, in terms of uh, our sample size and reducing the variance uh, in the data. So one other test that we ran uh, to try and get around that, that problem uh, was uh, by creating a series of binary indicators. Uh, which is what takes value one uh, if they've given more than a certain amount and zero otherwise. And we varied that amount. Uh, we, we, we ran through several scenarios of that amount. Uh, and the good thing about using a binary indicator is it gives it the data a certain distribution, and under that distribution, the variance is determined by the mean. So if they have the same mean, they have the same variance, and so you can pool uh, the data and, you, and, and combine the samples to effectively give you a larger sample size to test. Uh, and the results were almost always significant at 5%, except for the Lib Dems at £10,000 and below, and for crossbenchers. But then if you remember those tables I was showing you earlier of the averages, one of the notable things about the Lib Dems was just how much more generous their usual suspects are than the other parties. So that's not actually so much of a surprise. It shouldn't be taken as exonerating them. Um, so we can confidently reject the hypothesis that donation behavior is the same between the two groups, um, except for crossbenchers who are not, as I said, appointed by any of the political parties. We, would, we sort of expected that. Um, could that relationship be an artifact of some other factor? So is there some third factor that causes appear to both give a lot of money and not be a usual suspect? Uh, so we used a regression analysis to control four other factors and the link between donations and others survives, uh, whether we do, we, depending on whichever way we run the regression. If we run the regression with uh, membership of the others as the independent variable, it survives. If we run it uh, with um, donations as the independent variable, it survives. That relationship survives uh, a lot. The only, the only in other independent variables we can include and that have any relevance are party affiliation, gender, and whether they were born in the UK or not. 
Um, so there could well still be others. We've controlled for ones that we can gather uh, very easily. There could be others out there, and if uh, anybody wants us to tr has any ideas about how we could gather any of those other potential uh, uh, factors that could be conflating these issues, then we're perfectly happy to put that into the data and do it. Uh, so let's move on to the next test and think about the big donors. Uh, now, the big donors, uh, first of all, uh, we noticed this pattern uh, in the data, uh, which is that effectively, uh, if we look at this data, we've got uh, a decreasing frequency as we increase the amount donated, and then it starts to increase again as we get into the big donors. Uh, so uh, what's happening here, this was noticed as we were uh, entering the data, notice there's basically a, a gap right here in the middle of the data. So we just define people who make a large, make a single large donation of 30,000 pounds or more as a big donor, uh, and everybody else as a small donor. Because that gap was at about 30,000 pounds. Sorry? Uh, maybe they bought an OB, maybe, maybe they're just in the process. Because uh, also the other thing that comes out in the data is that Big donors don't usually give one large donation. It's normally spread out for a number of donations. So we're, we're re we really are going to be in a position here uh, of taking a very conservative view of what is a big donor and what is not. Um, uh, so we created a, a data set of donations, all donations larger than £30,000, of which there were about 780. Uh, we then count the number of peer nominees to whom we can contribute donations in this data. There were 27 of them. And then what we want to know is what is the probability of drawing a sample of 779 individuals from the pool of people eligible to be nominated for a peerage and finding 27 or more people in that sample who have, in fact, been nominated. Um, uh, so we know the number of people nominated for a peerage from three main parties. There are 233 of those. Uh, we need to estimate the number of people available for nomination. For that, we took the combined party membership of the three main political parties that we're looking at, uh, which is 383,800. Uh, then the probability of seeing 27 nominees in a random sample of 779 people drawn from party membership of 383,800 when there are 233 nominees available to be drawn within that sample is... 1.36 times 10 to the minus 38. Uh, and that's the number written out in the usual form. Uh, that is an astronomically low number. Um, it's difficult to conceptualize quite how small that number is. The first software package I used to calculate it just said it was zero. Uh, I had to use a, a, a faster computer and a different software package to actually get the number. It's roughly equivalent to, wish, to winning the National Lottery jackpot five times in a row. Uh, the sources of bias in our estimates mean that we are probably overestimating this number. Uh, that's because it's arguable that the pool of eligible nom nominees should be larger. Uh, the UK electorate is 44 million. Uh, the big donor database includes things that obviously aren't donations. So the big donor database that we look at, if one party, suppose that, for example, the Conservative Central Office gives some money to a local Conservative constituency, that, that qualifies as a donation. And so we're picking up inter movements between different branches of the same party are being picked up in those 779 large donations, as are certain forms of state funding, such as short money. Um, so we can say with a lot of confidence that big donors have a significantly higher probability of being nominated for a peerage than the rest of us. Uh, and then finally, to look at our third uh, test... There were 928 individuals elected to the House of Commons over the period of our study. Of these, four show up in the database of big donors. Uh, two are former prime ministers who we can exclude for a number of reasons. These guys were already sitting prime ministers. They had safe majorities in excess of 30,000. There is no way that this money is being used to buy access to the legislature. Um, uh, the two that remain donated substantial sums directly to their local parties. Uh, 
Um, so the probability of somebody who is elected to the House of Commons over this period also being a big donor is 0.2%, and the equivalent number for nominees to the House of Lords is 8.9%. Uh, are these numbers the same? And we can do another uh, difference in means test on that. And the probability of there being the same is 2.8 times 10 to the minus 18, which is another astronomically small number, which is uh, we're now in the region of only uh, two consecutive lottery jackpot wins for how improbable uh, that is. Uh, so nominees to the House of Lords are more likely to be big donors than those elected to the House of Commons. Uh, so all three of those hypotheses have been rejected um, uh, with, a, with a considerable degree of confidence. Uh, so we can be quite certain that, the, that this is not a coincidence uh, that so many big donors are in the House of Lords. Um, uh, but there are some caveats. Correlation is not causation. Our results are consistent with the sale of some peerages. However, despite our best efforts, we could still suffer from some omitted variable bias, by which I mean there could be some third factor not in our data related to both donations and your probability of being nominated for a peerage, uh, which we are not picking up. Uh, and it, it isn't difficult to come up with another story uh, which would be consistent with these relationships. Um, uh, so this isn't a smoking gun, and we certainly aren't at beyond reasonable proof. It's beyond a reasonable doubt level of proof. Uh, but I would argue that there is a case to answer, and saying, move along, please, there's nothing to see here, just makes you look a bit more like Officer Barb Brady from South Park. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who are familiar uh, with uh, with that, uh, okay, uh, I think uh, I'm ready to take questions as well. If there are any, but uh, you have to go. Yes, okay. Thank you. If there are any questions. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, we, uh, we, we considered, um, uh, we, we considered, uh, uh, we considered doing that. Uh, we, we do have our own list here. Uh, our method, the data is all publicly available and our methodology, uh, is publicly available. Uh, but given that our paper is saying, is, is effectively suggesting that people from the others may be purchasing peerages, uh, and uh, we, we decided it would not be prudent for us to have anything in our paper which could possibly identify people from the others uh, because we frankly can't afford barristers uh, and we, can't, we, we just can't afford a legal case. Um, uh, but uh, it, it wouldn't be difficult for somebody to do, in honesty. There is, there, there, is, there is that. So uh, this is something that we will... This, it, 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 we, we, we've gone through the peer review process for one journal which rejected it as, as being too UK-focused uh, to be interesting for their readership. So uh, we're currently going through peer review process of other journals, uh, and that's something that we will discuss uh, when we come to it. Uh, I mean, th there is an issue in terms of having to publish your data. Now, you don't normally publish your data on the... The journal's website, you normally publish it on your own website, in which case you've published it. So this is something that we're going to have to negotiate once we get through the peer review process. Okay. Thanks.